Welcome to our Coaches Kitchen Table Discussion Series, where you join myself and the top coaches and influencers in the sport community, where we talk about a variety of topics related to coaching, athlete development, and so on. This is part two of our discussion with Vicki Harbour. In part one, we talked about moving to LTA 3.0, the athlete development matrix, and Vicki started taking questions from coaches. This segment looks at biobanding and other influences on athlete development and coaching issues related to the LTAD. Uh, Brenda has a question. So uh, Brenda, you wanna go ahead and ask your question. Um, before I do, I'll just say, Adriana, you absolutely did the right thing putting your son where you did. I mean, he dominated even at 18 when he was 15. So he's a special kid. And I think <clears throat> the, the biggest thing, and you hit on it very well, uh, Vicky is the the social side of it you know when you're dealing with with 18 year olds and you're just barely out of elementary school it's it's a, a really tough thing and it was really nice to see certain athletes take him under their wing and be like a big brother and it needs that kind of whether it's imposed or it comes naturally because some kids are good leaders and sensitive um, to other kids needs I don't know but it has to be taken care of for sure. Um, I worry a little bit about what he'll do at 17 and 18 when now he doesn't have an up to play, um, you know, whether he'll get bored of it. But he's also been denied a, an opportunity to be a leader because he's always playing with kids two, three, four years older than himself. So that's also something that has to be managed. But my question, relates to our competition model. I'm on a review committee um, and people thought I was crazy and I want to know your opinion. Um, I suggested that we look at three-year age groups in competition so that if well, let's say we have, I know in Brazil they use the initiation stage, right Adriana? <laughs> Hi. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the initiation, whether it's 11, 12, 13 year olds, and the best of those three years play like in the first division of initiation, second division, doesn't matter which age you are, and then go backwards a bit and say 12 to 15 is in development one or whatever you want to call it, and then um, maybe 14 to 16 in development two, and 15 to 17 in, in competition and 16 to 18 in performance, or I'm sure we could come up with, I don't care if they're named after flowers, it really doesn't matter what they're called, but we, if you went to a three-year span, mm -hmm. then I think kids do ultimately play at their developmental level. Because if I'm, if I'm in development one and it's 12 to 15 and I'm 15, but I'm like Bambi on ice. I'm not coordinated yet. I'm six foot six um, um, or six foot two as a girl, you know, at 14 years old, then I, I can be in this division and there's no humiliation. I'm not playing down. I'm playing in a, you know, a, a wider category. Um, mm -hmm. And when I brought the idea up, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't jumped on. So then I tried two year age divisions. I noticed one of the other participants suggested that they do that in, in, uh, where he's from and um, people said well we've been there before this was an improvement and I'm not sure it was an improvement you know the idea of having two-year spans I think mm -hmm. allows people a bit more um, opportunity to, to find their development level um, mm -hmm. yeah if, if you're in a single age category and you're um, the third best left side you're going to be the third best left side at 15, at 16, at 17, and so on. You never get the opportunity to um, be a leader or, or you know, get ahead um, if, if other people are progressing at, at the same rate or better. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a fan of this larger um, age categories or development categories that get away from the words ages, or mm -hmm. at least that every team should be entitled to have two athletes who are one or even two years older if they meet certain physical characteristics. Um, uh, your reaction, am I crazy? <laughs> no, no, no. And, and I think that these are very, very important conversations which are often neglected 
you know, is that um, I think over the time I've been doing this, I find we have become slaves to chronological age. I, and I would say that happens within our education system as well. And if you go back historically, um, you know, education used to be, you know, like the one room schoolhouse, you know, there was mm -hmm. a wide range of, of, of ages and, you know, people would say, well, you didn't learn as much then, but there <laughs> is merit to a mixed age group for various reasons. And so I think anything that gets strapped to chronological age only is flawed. I think this is where discussions around really understanding athlete development, again, not just from the technical side, not just from the physical side that everybody can see, but from these other areas as well. And stop being so rigid about where a young athlete is training and competing. Now, that gets a lot of angst up because clubs want fixed rosters with all of the data around how old are they, um, around insurance costs if they're traveling here and not there. And I'm saying that's a, that's a system impediment. And that system impediment is getting in the way of, of strong athlete development. Now, I know not all volleyball clubs have the numbers within them. In fact, I think uh, yeah, so someone, someone mentioned that. Yeah. Yes. And then that to me <laughs> becomes all the more reason to get together with other sports that, um, when we have competition driving athlete development, that's ass backwards. And we need to have competition driven by athlete development. And so what that looks like is gonna be very contextually related based on your own lived area. You know, How many athletes are you dealing with? How many coaches do you have? Um, all of those pieces and can you, can you satisfy the requirement that the competition experience you are offering is satisfying athlete development? Because we, not to say we become lazy, I think the system enables laziness, that we often look at competition as our sole metric of athlete development. If we've got a, we've got a bunch of teams that are winning, we feel good about athlete development. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely limited. And that piece about leadership, um, whether you're talking about Adriana's son, you know, perhaps it would help Adriana's son to be explicit, explicitly guided to become a leader within his own chronological age group for portions of time. If given that, because he has benefited from, from leadership from others and Again, what kind of gift can you give another athlete but to bestow experiences around leadership skills? And yet if clubs or the, the staff or coaches are not open to those kinds of suggestions, it's not gonna fly. So I think that the, the way in which competition structures are set up need to answer that single question. Are we serving athlete development? And coaches have asked me as well, saying, well, what if you've got attributes, um, let's say that are halfway between learn to train and train to train? What the heck do you do with that? Mm -hmm. And that to me is all the more reason why you become nimble because kids don't grow up in neat and tidy packages. You know, they don't march along and progress from one stage to the next in all of their <laughs> humanness. Yeah. So, competitions need to, the discussion around competitions needs to become a little bit more deep and sophisticated around does it meet athlete development and what is the evidence that the competition offerings are satisfying athlete development and try it, pilot it with some mm -hmm. solid metrics that go well beyond winning and losing. You know, do we understand social emotional learning progressions? Are kids becoming 
more socially competent, more emotionally competent, more mentally competent. Those are the kinds of metrics which we are often um, shy or unable to include in our own toolkits. Yeah, hard to measure sometimes. We did try something new on the beach a couple of years ago called tall maples. And mm -hmm. athletes who are above a certain uh, number of centimeters were invited for this um, development program, extra training and so on, to try to build the number of blockers available for beach volleyball. Mm -hmm. But the concept is brilliant. We should be doing that kind of supplementary and special events for those kids and maybe for under, you know, five, eight boys and five, four girls or whatever as well. I don't know, but um, certainly if we're trying to build that base, that talent pool of, of physically capable athletes for the international level, then mm -hmm. taking that concept indoors is something we really should think about. Absolutely. And I would say if that is partnered with an acceptable, let's say metric coming out of the mental skills, and the life skills, which there are those metrics available, that within necessarily like a training camp, or when you, when, when you have athletes in a group for any period of time, coaches and staff can create an environment where some of these other features around their mental attributes and their social emotional attributes will become evident. And it becomes evident because we start to look for them. But as coaches, our eyes are often trained to only look at technical execution and physical specimens in front of us. So we need to broaden our vision to start incorporating, oh, that's an amazing physical specimen, but they're a bit of an idiot with the athletes. You know, they're, they're very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not gracious, they're, they're not helpful, they're not supportive, they're chirping. Um, those kinds of things that I think we, we need to help our coaches understand that those are important. And I know coaches know this stuff, but it's about enabling coaches to do something with that information um, that will help them um, become better coaches and help their athletes. Good. Yeah, I... I... You know, Brenda, you, you've done it. You've been working for a long time with the OVA, trying to get them to <clears throat> look big picture and move forward. And I and I, I think our competition mo model with OVA is is really self is, is a defeating purpose. Considering that w the OVA really preaches LTA, you know, LT. What is it now? Not LTAD. Oh, but still call it LTAD. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think we. And I'm glad that the OVA is starting to think more and more about trying to look at how we can do this better. And, and Brenda, with your, for me, what I see when you suggest a three age group uh, or, you know, chronological age as a group, you, we're still using the, th the huge level of turn. Like, I mean, 16 new girls, there's like 115 teams and there's like seven divisions of tournaments going on. So you could, you know, I mean, you could fit these in. So you're getting equal competition, meaningful competition based on your ability. And I think you help the, the teams that are out there with smaller amounts of people, allow them to form teams with three age groups and compete where they belong as well. So that the older mm -hmm. child in that group gets meaningful competition. The younger child might have to build up towards that, but at least they're getting that opportunity to compete. Whereas if you have to fold the team, they're not getting any competition. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, the only issue we have with the OVA in Ontario anyways is that we, it's a tournament based thing and it's a relegation tournament. Every tournament yeah. mm -hmm. from day one is relegation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to change. Yeah, that's thank goodness change. Cause to me, that's the biggest downfall that the, the OVA has. Like, we're, we're so big now we should be in a league format and where coaches can be, uh, feel more comfortable playing everybody. Uh, more often in meaningful minutes. And I think that, so, and that helps those athletes. What we're talking about with relegation, just to answer the question is, if you finish at the bottom of a tournament, you'll move down into a lower tier for the next tournament. So that's where the most parent complaints come from because coaches get scared. Uh oh, if we don't win these last two matches, we're going to move down. And mm -hmm. so they move to 
play all their best players, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and screw the fair play thing and, and out of fear that they'll move down. And so that fear creates a stress and then playing your best players may keep you in that division, but then you got a bunch of pissed off parents because their kid didn't play. So it's, you know, it's a really messy situation. So we're oh, trying to yeah. create a much smaller um, top tier at the beginning, maybe even only four teams. And every event, teams get promoted till we end up with 12 to 16 in the very top end. Um, you know, nobody moves down, you just keep getting promoted. And so um, that's something that, that may well be in the future model. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, and, and it's, you know, the fear, not even the fear of moving down, it's just if you do move down, there is a disparity, a dispar uh, D discrepancy between where you are so you're coming in ranked first in the next one but then there's teams that have moved up that are nowhere in your class so then you're you're spending a whole weekend hotel costs gas costs uh the, the tournament cost and you're you don't get anything out of the tournament until maybe your semi-final or your court your final game uh, to move back up so it, i think that that's you know that again it goes back to that athlete development is it really helping the athlete develop in that type of circumstance. So it's good to see we're moving on. I'm gonna just keep going because John has a question. So John, you wanna turn on your mic there and ask your question. I, I guess I, I, I can see how Brendan in, it would have a great opportunity with the OVA to model some of this stuff, but I'm, I, I've always thought Altad at, as a practical coach, like, you know, I coached 12 and, or 13 and 14 new girls. To take that long term as a mature coach, I don't really, you know, my my self worth isn't defined by how children uh, perform. So I can take a long term, and I'm very comfortable with sacrificing short term for long term. And that's always kind of been my biggest takeaway from Altad at, at my at the grassroots. I have twelve athletes level. Mm -hmm. I think Colin brought up an interesting one where we have started to train like multiple groups together, like maybe three teams together, like 30 athletes. And then at the, at some point in time, you, you, you go down to three teams of 10, you don't choose right away and you can train um, whether it's by position or by uh, uh, athletic ability or skill level. But there, even then there's a, still a stigma sometimes within that, even at, at the age groups, mm -hmm. still struggling with some of that stuff. Cause uh, like I had two teams last year and we tried to put some athletes together that may or may not be at the same level of skills as some of the others. And it instantly, you know, you, it's like you've just, you know, chastised them and they go, you know, to the other place, like their tails between their legs. I, I still don't get the, how some of that stuff can be sold properly, even in that context. Is yeah, it, and, and I, you're right, it's, it's not um, the communication of it, and, and they speak about that within biobanding, you know, that it wasn't an overnight sell, um, for sure, that there was, um, at every level, coaches, athletes, and parents um, concerned of varying degrees of, of volume and animation about what was being done with the sport. And I think the, the starting with some, um, I, I, again, when you have metrics, when you have some type of measurable that you're trying to achieve and you introduce it for a certain period of time that um, it doesn't, people can, there's always gonna be people who whinge about any type of change and yet when you can start identifying areas of satisfaction, areas of athlete progress that have occurred with this kind of mixed or hybrid kinds of environments where sometimes you train together with mixed groups, sometimes you're training on your own, competitions if they're flexible enough uh, to allow a variable roster depending on people's availability, um, so it's not, a, it's not a clean cell um, that again comes across with one, one message, one memo, so to speak. And, um, and this is again where the, the conversations about why these are done 
um, need to be quite transparent as well across coaches because if if coaches themselves you've self admitted John that you you haven't hitched your wagon of of self worth to um, to the success or outcomes of of this of this team that you coach. Um, not all coaches could honestly say that. Um, and again, it's part of it is that the competition system needs to honestly reflect athlete development. And if the, the, the people in charge of competition structures refuse to let go, it's like ice hockey. If they refuse to let go of full size rink for six and seven year old boys, or girls playing on the on the rink, my goodness, you know, we will never be able to achieve athlete development and progression. So um, that's why I say some of these very difficult conversations, if we continue to ignore them, athlete development, let alone high performance achievement in any sport, is going to continue to suffer. So this is where um, conversations need to be brought out and being very clear about why is this being done. And I often say to people, when, when I step into a room, I say, before I say anything here, I said, I have not come in here to make your day miserable. I have not come in here to universally piss everybody off. And yet, I guarantee people are gonna get pissed off, people are gonna become agitated, and it's so important that we have those conversations because when we get through those conversations and start talk, talking to coaches or teachers about what is really at stake here, and then when we start getting some consensus around what is most important and are we being as inclusive and, and welcoming, are we keeping kids in the hunt as long as necessary? Um, these are the kinds of things that start to emerge. So I'm, I, I feel, I say I'm, I'm somewhat badly feeling badly that I can't come up with a really slick answer for you, John, but it's, um, I know that the root to many of this is having these, what I call uncomfortable conversations about changes to our competition structure to support athlete development. And on, on John's side, for me, uh, what I see here is this is a great opportunity for life skills. Uh, you know, when, when you, if you're disappointed in the situation you're in, okay, you're rightfully so disappointed. So my question to you is, what are you going to do about it? Like, if, if you believe you belong up here, you can only control what you can control, right? I mean, that's a life skill that we all, I know I'm still working on, is... Mm -hmm. How do I, okay, I can control my effort. I can control how I work hard. I can control on my, how positive I am. I can control those things. Mm -hmm. And what I'm being told is that there are six or 10 players ahead of me, or because it, it's probably more specific, position specific, there's one or two, three people ahead of me. I need to look at them and evaluate, okay, what are they doing that I'm not, that I can work on mm -hmm. to get better than them so that I make the coach have to make a decision next time? Because that's all I can do. Mm -hmm. And those are the types of skills that I think we, our kids need to learn. I think we've been bubble wrapped. We've bubble wrapped our kids for so long. Any adversity, they can't deal with, mm -hmm. and and they don't could not. They can't. They don't know how to deal with it because they've never yes. dealt with adversity before. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons our mental health is such it, for our teenagers is so high or yeah. so stressed, is because they've never learned how to fail and come out of failing. Yeah. They've always been protected uh, mm -hmm. by 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 over by loving parents. Mm -hmm. um, who grew up in, most of us grew up in the other side of the coin where, where it wasn't as supportive and failing was, yeah, I just get on and work harder then, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I think that's the lesson we can use in these circumstances. And that's where, you know, that's what this LTAD model is looking at is trying to teach those life skills. And that's a perfect example because mm -hmm. in the long run of someone not being on that A team at 14U, it really won't have a main, it, it shouldn't have a major impact on their overall life and, and experiences. It's just another part of their life. And now, and they can still be a university athlete. They can still be uh, a straight A student or whatever they want. They can still do that. And it doesn't define them by this particular moment. 
And that's yeah. something we can really teach them. It, it, it really help athletes and or kids learn right now is that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. And that that and you're spot on, Colin, around we don't create environments where our children learn to struggle. Um, in fact, I, over time, I mean, I know there's lots of stuff about, you know, fail fast, fail forward. Um, failing is your first attempt in learning. And I, you know, we, we, we have to fail to learn all of those kinds of cliches. And yet failing is, is really the outcome. And I would say that our kids, long before they fail or succeed, they, they don't even know how to struggle. They don't know how to get into a situation. I'm, I'm generalizing here, but when something becomes a little bit difficult for them, and it's often difficult because they're unfamiliar with it, and especially teens where they don't want to look foolish amongst their peers, um, that risk of looking foolish, not doing very well, they become risk averse. And what we're learning about resilience within that is that resilience, most people will think, well, it's all up to the individual. It's about a rugged individual who gets you know, traumatized, lots of adversity, this, that, and the other thing, and, and has the wherewithal to pull up their own bootstraps and move on to success. And yet what research is telling us right now is that, yes, individual ruggedness is part of resilience, but what is equally important and essential is what is the resources that that individual has around them to help them through a difficult situation and you cannot have one without the other and this is where if you if if we actually listen to stories of of athletes uh, if we listen to stories of successful people in business in academia wherever is that they, they, they will identify not only what they had to do themselves, but they will always identify as well who were those individuals or organizations or places that had the time of day for them to help them through a difficult situation. And whereas culturally, we sometimes think, well, you're a bit of a wimp if you've got to go and ask for help. No, no, it's a cornerstone of becoming resilient when you know what your resource network is. Yeah, I, mean, I know in my class, I, I mean, what I found is this, we, I've classified it as planned helplessness. Uh, mm -hmm. The, the go-to, uh, uh, anytime you ask it, well, I'm generalizing, but it, it feels like uh, whenever you ask, okay, here's, what, here's the instructions, go ahead and start your work. The first thing, I don't get this. The first thing out of their mouths is, I don't get this. So and then you ask, well, what did you do? Well, I read it. Okay, but what did you do after that? So they're, they're, you know, it's just easy for them to say, I don't get it. They want you to do it for them. And it's to hound on them to come up with their own plan and solution. Try it. If it doesn't work, no problem. Try it again. Try something different. Make adjustments. And uh, it's the same with the athlete, right? Is, oh, I don't get this. This is too hard. This I can never do this. Yeah, yeah. but why not what what have you done you know and and helping them learn that that idea that the skill they have now if you take a look at where they want to if they say i want to be a university player okay well look at your skills are they the same as that university player mm -hmm. if the answer is no you've got to make some changes yeah but it's hard i agree and i bet you when that university player was your age they were making the same mistakes you were so we have to you know educate them on that type of concept it's not a it's not the volleyball farriers where you go to bed at night and, and, and wish for uh, volleyball skills and they come and yeah. tap you on the head and you have them the next day. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you've practiced, you'll develop those neuroplasticity and those pathways. Yes, but it doesn't yeah. work. You know, you have to put the time and effort into it to make it work. So exactly. I, I think that's, again, it, goes, it keeps harming back to these life skills. That's where we as volleyball coaches can do a great, mm -hmm. provide a great opportunity for our kids to learn these skills. And yeah. then, and what will happen from that, I think, is they'll become better volleyball players yes. uh, for the club or for the team, or they'll come back as coaches because yeah. they've learned so much about being more self-confident mm -hmm. uh, and dealing with situations and stuff. So, uh, I, you know, I think we're all, the good coaches or the coaches that are in it for the right reasons all realize that winning isn't the all, be all end all and it doesn't define them who they are. Yes. It doesn't mean it's easy. 
right? I mean, it doesn't mean it's easy every day. When you lose, you still feel the loss. And yeah. you still, you know, you, you want to fix that. You feel bad for your athletes, you, you know, and all that. But in the big picture of it, the big forest, you look at, okay, what can we learn from this? How do we move forward? And you teach your athletes the same thing. And now I think we can be, and I think we do that subconsciously, mm -hmm. but I think we can do that more explicitly now and, and talk yes. about this. What are we learning from this? This is an opportunity to learn from this experience. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about, okay, what's our game plan yeah. and have them part of the solution as yeah. much as, uh, you know, just going home and doing it on your own. So let them learn and take ownership of fixing the problem. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think, I think we, you know, and, and again, our NCCP courses don't teach any of this to us, right? No. Uh, it's, the, right. it's the coaches that are coming on these types of webinars and, and meetings and listening to these podcasts that are out there that are starting to pick up that. And hopefully um, – it starts a groundswell of moving in this way and teaching these life skills. And, and as Brandon was saying, you know, we're with this COVID right now, we have a great opportunity to think outside the box about our programs and how to deliver things in a different way that helps that athlete become that the best they possibly can and includes life skills now. So yeah, uh, that's a great question. All right. Uh, nobody, uh, Brandon, do you want to just explain your comment on there? Because uh, Vicky's from your area, to, part of town, so she uh, may be, uh, know more about this as well. But you want to back, tell us what's going on in Alberta with volleyball? Yeah, so my context is a little smaller than I'm sure a lot of other people is small town. So when we were talking with Brenda a little bit, um, I have to move athletes up and a lot of times, and it doesn't quite fit the context per perfectly just because out of – you know, U13 to U18, we're trying to scrape to get one team sometimes in some years. And so we're pulling up, a, we're getting kids jumping two age brackets, three age brackets, just so we can make a team, but also have them have an opportunity to play too. Um, so it's a smaller context, but right now I'm doing a lot of work where AVA is not providing anything for anybody. So you have parents calling that they're calling their resources, the camps that have done stuff before that they know of and they have a number and they're hey what, what do we do because they have nowhere to look for now so it's truly a build it and they will come scenario so if we can implement very good things that that tie into that we're using sport we're using volleyball specifically as a vehicle to teach young athletes young adults these life skills it's mm -hmm. still sport there's so much we can teach out of it yeah. that we we'll provide this new framework that people can flock to it. And then Alberta Volleyball is taking a hands-off approach now where we're not running anything, but if you're going to do something based upon Alberta health rules right now, we have some flexibility to work in. Okay, well, here's some guidelines. And if you want to run something, well, some people aren't doing anything. And there's not a lot of ambitious coaches, ambitious people there that want to put their name on the line in case something happens, but it really provides a great opportunity for people on this call, us, that, you know, if we have the right mindset and, and the right lessons to teach that we don't have to work within a framework that has been, that hasn't been working anymore. It needs to evolve and can't really evolve maybe at the top end or, or has never been forced to evolve. And now we can run really cool programs where we have a couple of kids in our area here that um, really shine above everybody else, but the kids they get to play with aren't that skilled. So really teaching them how to be leaders, but they're lagging behind because they never get to play alongside those really good athletes and see an outside picture. So going into Edmonton, because this is white court going into Edmonton mm -hmm. before COVID, we were running practices with some Edmonton teams and they would host us. Yeah. And it was spectacular because they get to see yeah. a different view. What but a lot of yeah. open yeah. to seeing what another club is doing, what other athletes are doing. And, and for us, we feel that, we're a little lower than them. Well, go and play and see what it's like. And I have an opportunity to play with some coaches that say, hey, come and be a part of this. Awesome. We'll totally do that. And it gives a different outlook. But yeah. now that not really do much, it really allows us to almost do whatever we want and to start on a different path now. And yeah. hopefully AVA, a Volleyball can can kind of see and say, hey, this is what's working down here. Maybe let's pull some things out of this and implement them on a higher level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this is one of the things where, I mean, COVID has just flipped so many things on its head around um, what does sport look like? 
and and you're right it, you know the the opportunities to uh correct or instill some of the features that sport has been lacking you know there are opportunities for that you know if if in in your area of white court you have difficulty fielding the numbers required um to to uh, run appropriate volleyball training sessions and competition is it possible to get a larger group of young athletes together that is more than volleyball and target the life skills as as you've suggested and if there are other coaches in the white court area that have similar desires that they're feeling you know restricted about what they can do within their own specific sport is there a way of getting a larger group together within that white court region and working on those life skills and sharing in some of the coaching expertise that each coach would bring to a larger group i and i and i mean i i agree i mean here in edmonton i mean I, I barely hear of anything starting to open up around giving permission around, you know, advancing phase two or whatever the language is around uh, creating appropriate openings for starting to launch training sessions. Um, I mean, look at pro sport. I mean, they're still stuttering into finishing off any types of seasons. So we're certainly not alone in the, um, in the in the the um, sort of the the disappearance of sport as we knew it, and yet the idea that you suggest has incredible merit to it. Around, well, can what's our context? What what do we have that is around us, and what can we work with? And so, if there's yourself, Braden, and if you've got other willing and able coaches, even starting up a conversation like that, because you know, summer's coming. Who knows what the fall is going to look like around school? I mean, the university I know is is still going to be all online. Um, this isn't going to disappear in you know in the next couple of weeks. So that could be a very local conversation that you could you could have with coaches around what kind of experiences and what kind of um, sport environments do we want to create for our kids in White Court. Are you are you a teacher, Braden? Nope. <laughs> Just somebody who likes to give back. I had good role models that gave a lot to me, so I got to give it back to them. Yeah. And so if you, I don't know if if, if you know many of the coaches within your community from um, either, you know, from other sports. Yeah, there's some. It kind of ties into the context a little bit of the, of it's the wrong path. I feel it's not a path that we should be continuing on. Um, we don't have a lot of new and upcoming coaches that have new ideas. It's old ideas that are stuck. And, and they're mm -hmm. the ones that have the credibility that people continuously look towards because they do provide something and they provide value. They got good systems that um, parents trust and stuff. So as for anything that's uh, having open conversations in my region, it's a little tougher. There's definitely people to talk to, but mm -hmm. it's for me, it's just reaching out. Edmonton has got some, some good resources that I've worked along with like pursuit volley has been phenomenal with working with me on some things. And so trying to tie in and just reaching out to anybody and working and what can we do? Cause like we said before, it's, there, it's, there's nothing built for anybody. So if somebody wants to participate in something, they pretty much got to use whatever we do. And so we can provide whatever Lee house leagues we want to do following health guidelines. And now they have guidelines. It's okay. Now we have a framework that it's not, oh, hold up, can't do any sports. It's, okay, now we have some ideas. How can we work? This is this acceptable. Awesome. Here's our procedure. If you can follow it, awesome. Come and be with us. Yeah. yeah. So it's not so much just specifically in my area. It's, for me, it's, with well, technology. We're on a Zoom call with people all over the country, right? So yeah, yeah. Awesome to kind of reach out. And if you build it, a lot of people will come. I think we're going to be running a camp later on that uh, people might be driving a decent, uh, open to driving a decent distance towards because they just have no other opportunities elsewhere. No, you're right. And, and in fact, you talked about going in from White Court into Edmonton. Um, I mean, and U of A right now isn't going to be running any summer camps. The varsity athletes aren't uh, going to be doing anything. So 
does that become an opportunity where you reach out to those people in Edmonton and say, hey, um, we've got an audience in White Court, you know, again, I think just creating those conversations, you know, I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? You know, people are going to say no. Um, and, and an opportunity, as I say, at this point in time, the people, the sports that, that will get to the other side, not even the other side, but the sports that are going to be able to adapt to COVID and all of the craziness that has come along with it are those sports that have been, um, have, are surrounded with people who are open-minded, who are open-hearted, and really have the athlete in mind. Um, and that's where, who cares what sport it is? And I don't mean that in a dismissive kind of way, but if we really believe that sports become a, um, an excellent environment for the life skills, equipping of life skills of our young athletes, and building on that and then some of the technical skills grow and their physical capabilities grow, then get those like-minded individuals together. Reach out to schools, you know, if there are coaches within schools. Um, and I, um, I know here in Edmonton, I've worked with uh, Edmonton Sport Council for many years, and this would be something that if we got an idea for something, we would float it out through the Edmonton Sport Council and, and just say, send out an invite. You know, we'd like to hear people's opinions on this, or we'd, we'd like to have a roundtable discussion around what do people think. Um, so yes, it's more work, but then you get to craft some of those early experiences for the athletes, for their families, for yourself as, as the leader and, and coach. Um, I know it's, again, it's, it's not bulletproof. It's not a simple black and white answer, but this COVID thing has, has really wreaked havoc with protocols and all those kinds of things. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, swing now from that big picture, uh, life skills on athletes, and then try to get you to now move into winning and losing. So let's talk about gold medal pathway. <laughs> Okay. And you, I know you'll tie it into life skills, but uh, what is new about this gold medal pathway that uh, coaches that are working in that, you know, we're pretty much all on the train to train up to uh, train to win components. Yes. So what are we looking at here with this gold medal pathway? Is there anything big difference in there? Or well, are we... yeah. So if, so the gold medal profile and podium pathway are terms uh, used by own the podium. And so on the podium, which is really, I mean, I, I think it says it in its title. Um, it's about dealing with the, um, or targeting those sports and athletes that are already excellent and identified as international superstars and providing them support to go and compete at an Olympic Games, a, a Paralympic Games, and end up on the podium. And so the, the podium pathway is sort of this, um, the, the, what's called the, um, those stages of long-term athlete development and that, that trajectory toward a podium pathway, much broader based. Gold medal profile becomes much more specific and that requires a sport that has been targeted by OTP and, and, and targeted, meaning that that sport has demonstrated excellence and success at a particular level. And so that gold medal profile is filled with performance standards. And so that, yes, that sh graphic that you're showing right here shows well, how does this athlete development matrix and gold medal profile fit together? So the athlete development matrix is a set of attributes and skills necessary for athlete development progression. The gold medal profile comes in and it's very much performance related. So times for swimmers or um, athletes on the track, um, winning style of, of play uh, comes into it as well, which is more for the team sports around 
what is the kind of tactical evidence-based um, uh, strategies that are deemed um, world leading, so to speak. So those then become uh, the, the standards upon um, own the podium to identify which sports and athletes are going to receive a pocket of extra money. And so in our recent work with Own the Podium is we're trying to make the athlete development matrix and the gold medal profile integrated and seamless so that the athlete development matrix is providing all of the necessary goods for athletes as they develop, which is what we've been largely discussing along the way. And then as the athlete progresses up through train to train for most sports, um, what kind of performance standards do they start to meet? What's the criteria they need to meet in order to progress on this gold medal profile? So what's shown here is you can see the stages from left to right of, of long-term athlete development and the athlete development matrix will dominate in those early stages. And you can see that it, it's the, the triangle thins as we progress along and that white panel existing between the athlete development matrix and gold medal profile, that gives sports wiggle room as to when do performance standards start to dominate more and influence more the training of that athlete and become more demanding around what are the times they're putting in? What's the weights that they're pushing? What are the tactics that they're learning? What are the kinds of techniques that they're able to execute and so on. And so there's this wiggle room in the, in the middle of the two. Now, if you go to the, uh, that other graph that shows the, the purple, um, the ADM and, and gold medal profiles um, fit together. Uh, I marked it up to say. Uh, where'd it go? Right there. Nope. There we go. And then the um, and then the extra panels will will provide some descriptors on that right hand side, Colin, when you can. Um, so again, this is showing the uh, long term athlete development stages uh, on the left. Okay. There we go. There we go. Thank you. And then across the top, you'll see the different uh, components of athlete development. And then in the middle, you will see in the stages where the gold medal profile, those performance requirement skills will, will derive the training and performance requirements of the athlete. The train to train is a huge transition area. Again, part of that is because of that turbulence of growth and development, puberty and so on, is that we can't make hard and fast decisions at that period of time for, again, the reasons we've been talking about is we, we select and deselect based on false information. And this, this illusion of, of performance that we see in a 14 year old is the imagined performance when they're 24. And we, we gotta get rid of that. So that shows where the gold medal profile fits in there. What you will see is on the right hand side, life skills, the gold medal profile does not touch that at all. And yet we understand very clearly is that if, if we have undeveloped life skills, it, it hinders all kinds of sport participation. Those uh, poor developed life skills puts our own high performance athletes at risk for, for conditions around suffering from mental health, um, poor relationships, poor long-term outcome around career, and, and, and again, the life skills um, really set the stage for this sport development in, in our kids and youth. So that then kind of swings the whole piece into, um, I mean, true, true high performance where it's about the pinnacle of performance for your sport. And, um, and again, whether it's at, at uh, World Cups, whether it's at Olympic Games, Paralympic Games, um, international contests, and so on. Is this is this not uh, the gold medal pathway not touching uh, the athlete development matrix because 
on the podium hasn't recognized the importance of these skills or done the research about these uh, uh, life skills that fit in or is it just simply you know what uh we'll take the 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 depressive you know the the athlete who goes into a depressive state as long as they get us a medal we're good with that like i mean to me having the, the that resilience and all those skills that would be important would be an important matrix for uh to be in the gold medal pathway wouldn't it 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 would be and i i would i would have to say that um this uh life skills in in my opinion and in the reading of it i think has largely been ignored um because it's been difficult to have metrics over it you know how do you assess somebody's emotional regulation compared to their ability to execute technique a b and c um it's we much easier to put in education though sorry we do that all the time in education when we're doing assessments for children to see if they're adhd or on the spec ed or autism spectrum and we're doing there's like yeah i think it's possible i mean obviously you need a psychiatrist and psychologist well, to be able and, to do these tests but and and again remember we said that the 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 vast majority of our coaches are run by volunteer mom and pop show right and right, that right. they and when when we even talk about the highest end of coach development does it touch on these attributes of athletes and i would say it's only been in recent years where we've realized that the lives of our most successful athletes are not that peachy keen no, some of them are really, really yeah yeah i mean the bell let's talk shows gives you great examples of how many of our great athletes that are our heroes have had mental illness at some point yeah and yeah. the other thing we we suffer from and it's a is that we only tell the stories of those athletes who have been on the podium or have worn the red and white we right. rarely ever tell the story of the athlete who became a train wreck and never got to wear red and white never got to the olympics never got to a podium and that's a that's a phenomena called survivor bias we only examine the way to do things based on those people that have succeeded and that in and of itself is very very it puts huge limitations and puts a huge ceiling on our ability to think about what is the right thing for us to do in athlete development right from the very beginning all the way up to become the best in the world not just for one olympic quad but for multiple olympic quads right all right uh let's see that yeah so you, i mean that's what you've just hit on is that they have to be integrated to work that's what? right yeah so my question my question to you would be for the coaches that are sitting there online right now a coach the 17 18 u or 12 u athlete what would you suggest oops, um, to them would be a good opportunity for them to that they could implement right away in their coaching or something that they could be thinking about now that would be different than they normally do based on uh, the learning skills concept that we want to be more uh, extrinsically involved with. Yeah, and or, which sorry, age, explicitly involved with. Yeah, and which ages again, Colin? So, uh, well, we're right here. We've got the train to train age group right up to uh, train to win. So, or okay. uh, compete to win. So, you got the whole yeah. gambit. What could we be doing right yeah. away in life skills uh, to make it more explicit in our practices and our gyms? Yeah. I so I would say, let's say from, from big picture points of view, things that we've already touched on right now is even at the train to train stage, um, encouraging multi-sport experience. Um, because again, that's often in the hands of a coach, but giving permission, so to speak, to go and try something else or not. That's in the hands of a coach. Um, and then this integrated training and competition, again, that we've talked about the vertical movement of athletes, um, you know, training and competing occasionally, um, where it fits uh, to um, 
that we had that discussion around biobanding. So I would say those are big picture pieces. From a more explicit detailed point of view, I'm gonna ask you to, to put up that slide around, uh, which one is it here? If maybe start, let's just start with, with slide number five. Cause that, and then uh, slide five, six and seven, um, I think okay. we'll get a sense of what we're trying to create. And so these life and mental skills, which we're trying to really have shine within that sporting environment, is that these life skills are the, the this whole foundation of success, that um, uh, of human success. And so we need to appropriately develop, create these environments where executive functions, those are early, um, early development of things like um, working memory, um, self-regulation, patience, and so on. But this was a quote around, um, uh, around success in school and one's career requires creativity, flexibility, self-control, and discipline. And when I ask any coach, do they want that in an athlete? There's going to be a universal yes, 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 and yes. And so these are important features that how do we create environments that challenge the athlete's creativity, their flexibility to attend to different, uh, different commands, demands, uh, distractions, self-control and discipline. And this is again where the, the coach when they are focusing on something like these features, that they need to set the stage for it very clearly. So at the beginning of a practice, of a training session, that it's explained that this is what they're looking for. It's not like a, a hidden agenda or like a jack-in-the-box kind of surprise. And through the course of that training session, if athletes are demonstrating positive features around what is being asked of them, that it's imperative that the coach recognizes that and rewards that. So again, the coach doesn't sort of set the stage for it, yet fall back to um, only, only looking at technical or, um, or tactical execution. And on the next slide, if we move into uh, after this one, and so these are the kinds of things about, I, I think our language with our athletes um, can also, we can help them develop their own vocabulary around how well do you follow directions, um, around controlling impulses. If you get irritated by something, what kind of behavior emerges? You know, are you aware of it? Can you, uh, can you control it? Uh, huge aspects around focus and being, pro you know, providing environments where huge attention to detail and specific commands are held. Uh, and so on, being patient, paying attention, taking turns and persevering. These are uh, ones that can certainly start well before train to train, but do not stop at any time in an athlete's trajectory. And then on the next slide. Well, and just on this one, I see, you know, this is a great opportunity for coaches to do these things in, the, in between uh, games at tournaments and stuff. There's lots of these things you could be working on, <clears throat> even as part of your uh, pre-meeting uh, practice stuff, a lot of these things we can be doing as part of your initial warm up of gathering everyone together and getting them focused is yeah. be working on these types of uh, skills, uh, explicitly letting them know today we're working on uh, focus and here's a little task you're going to do before we get started. I think it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for us as coaches to implement this stuff. Yes, and, and, and on that one, and this, this continues with it, Colin, is that Sometimes we use language, uh, so let's say if it was about uh, focus, having athlete voice contribute to it around, you know, when, so a coach can say, when I say the word focus, what does that mean to you? And so you have the athletes contribute, okay, well, this is what I think focus is. And, and then the coach can ask, how do I know when, when you are focusing? And then they can contribute to that. Another question is, how can I tell when you're not focusing? And so it becomes also, it starts to also build trust between coach and athlete when you start using this shared language 
and you understand each other. That's where, again, a lot of the, the mental skills and the terminology becomes um, lost when we don't really feel that we're talking about the same thing. And so when we, we, we start with these executive functions, and on this slide, what we're talking about is the social emotional learning. And I'm not going to read what's out to you there, but um, there is... Um, there is so much in there that when we think about sport, isn't that exactly what we want sport to, um, uh, to build within our young athletes? And then that link below, and Colin, I'm not sure if you can maybe send that out or if, if people want to just contact me directly. Um, I was asked to write sort of a general article on development of executive functions and social emotional learning skills through sport. And, um, and so I'd be happy to, to share that as well. So things like, you know, feeling and showing empathy for others, darn tootin' that's, that's important in sport, about how you um, uh, establish and maintain positive relationships, making responsible decisions. All of this falls under the social emotional learning umbrella. And then the last slide that I can show on that, Colin, is so these are uh, called the core competencies for social emotional learning. And when you see those five, self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision making, relationship skills, and social awareness, these are recognized in the literature as these core competencies. And within each of those, so for instance, with uh, social awareness, um, can you take the perspective of others? Do you demonstrate empathy? Uh, is, are you showing respect? And within that, what the literature base has, has created are metrics. And not only then can the coach look at an athlete's social awareness and say, yeah, they're showing respect for others or not. And um, but as well, especially with train to train and above, you reveal this completely transparently to the athlete themselves saying, this is what we're looking at. So, and then in relationship skills, things like communication, um, teamwork, my goodness, that is so filled with riches and rewards around discussions that it doesn't become just lip service around it but what are we going to do about it? And everybody has a chance to make a voice to it. Perfect. All right. Um, I think uh, we've, we've been talking for over two hours, so we've shared oh, a lot wow. of information. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, oh, I want to, uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for sticking around for that long and listening. And thank you for those that provided questions. This is the end of our Coaches Table discussion series with special guest Vicki Harbour. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more videos.